Hey everyone, I hope everyone's doing well today. Uh, today what I'd like to talk about is a continuation from last class um, and the Russian Revolution and to look more specifically about how uh, the Bolsheviks are going to officially take over. Um, we're almost there. They almost have done that based on what we talked about last class, but there's just a couple other things that are going to happen. Uh, so we want to kind of explain that. And then what we're also going to talk about is the rule um, of Joseph Stalin, who is one of the more notorious rulers um, when we talk about Russia and the soon-to-be Soviet Union. So we'll be taking a look at some of his uh, legacies of his rule, you know, how he's going to operate, how he's going to fix or change Russia. Um, and then next class, we'll look more specifically at some primary sources in order to really understand this guy even more fully. All right. Um, let's by kind of going right back to where we finished last class. And if you remember by October of 1917, the Bolsheviks have taken control of the government. They've, you know, charged the government offices of the provisional government. The provi provisional government being relatively unpopular has kind of stepped down on their own accord. And so now what we're going to kind of talk about is uh, what's going to happen next and how are they going to officially be the major ruler of uh, Russia. So anyways, what you want to remember is that even though the Bolsheviks have taken control of the provisional government, the reality is they haven't necessarily gained everyone's support. If you remember, they had those elections in 1917, they lost, and therefore they just eliminated the National Assembly altogether. And if you remember, this was the first democratically elected assembly in Russian history. It exists for basically a day because uh, the Bolsheviks lose. So they just say, you know what? No, we're not going to do it anymore. You know, uh, the people don't understand, you know, democracy or anything like that. So we need to take control. Uh, this is going to cause some tensions, some anger among groups, especially social revolutionary groups, for example, that are saying, wait a minute, you know, we won. I mean, th this is ridiculous. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. Um, another thing that I want to draw to your attention is that if you remember one of the things that Lenin said was that he wanted to end war with Germany. And very shortly after coming to power, they're going to sign a treaty with Germany known as the Treaty of Brass Livok. And if you look here on the map, what you can see is this is the area that's going to be sacrificed by Russia, given to Germany, so they can leave the war. And what's kind of fascinating about this is, as you can tell, it's a quite a significant amount of territory. And so many within Russia are saying, yeah, we, we wanted peace. We don't want to fight the war anymore. But giving up this amount of land, I mean, that's insanity. Uh, that's really, you know, not what we wanted. And that's going to be a hit to our power. Um, and if you recall, at, at the Treaty of Versailles, they're not going to give this land to Germany, but they're not going to give it back to Russia. Instead, these will become new countries and um, all the rest of that kind of stuff. But either way, this has the Russian people upset. Because the Bolsheviks do not necessarily have total and complete control, people that are opposed to the Bolsheviks are going to form an army known as the White Army to fight against the Bolsheviks. And again, this is a very diverse group. They're some within the white armies that are communists. There's some that are czarists. There's some that believe in democracy. I mean, there's kind of a whole plethora of attitudes. But what you want to realize is that they all are united in the sense that they do not like the Bolsheviks and they do not want the Bolsheviks to be in control of Russia. Uh, these white armies have the support of the United States and other Western European countries. And it's not a ton of support, but at the same time, they're going to try to give the white army guns and weapons and supplies and other things for them to be able to fight a war. We're going to look more at this as we continue through here, but for the United States, for other Western European countries, communism was very bad. And so the fear of a communist country taking control um, is something that needs to be ultimately avoided. And so that's why they're going to give these white army support. Uh, basically like, hey, hey, you know, defeat the Bolsheviks. Make sure that they don't give up uh, the, you know, uh, control here uh, to the, the communists. I mean, we don't want that. Um, so what will lead is for about the next three years, 
from about 1917, 1918 to about 1921, 1922, there's going to be a civil war within Russia. And the two groups are those white armies that we talked about, again, um, anti-Bolsheviks, and then the Red Army or the Red Guards. These are the Bolsheviks themselves. Um, so um, this is going to be basically for control of Russia. You can imagine if you were a Russian person, uh, all the chaos. And again, you know, finally you think, okay, the czar is gone. Now this new government's into play. Then the Bolsheviks overthrow that provisional government. And even with the Bolsheviks now technically in control, there's still challenges to their rule. So much so that a civil war will result out of this. This civil war is incredibly brutal. And there's a heavy number of casualties. Millions and millions of Russian people will die. A lot, obviously, from the actual fighting of the war, but many because of famine and hunger and other uh, kind of side effects of the war that they're going to be affected by. Now, for as big as the white armies are, they're very divided, and that has a lot to do with kind of their makeup. The only thing that unites these groups is that they don't like the Bolsheviks. But other than that, they're, they don't really have a firm idea or a for, firm thought of what they want the afterward to look like, what that they want to, to, to kind of what Russia should be. Um, so because of that, um, they are going to not be able to really fight uh, very long because they're going to be divided among themselves, lack kind of common leadership, lack kind of a common goal. That's incredibly problematic. Another thing is that the Red Army, they are united. They know exactly what they want. They want a communist Russia. Okay? They also have very good organization. We talked about this earlier. They have very good discipline, and they have a good military leader, the Red Army in particular, and they're led by uh, the kind of number two guy of the Bolsheviks at this point, um, a guy by the name of Leon Trotsky. And Trotsky is going to be really instrumental in bringing this whole thing together and really being a very good ruler and leader uh, for the Red Army, giving them that guidance, giving that them support, brilliant strategies, able to um, really bring this whole thing together. Uh, so finally, after a few years of fighting, uh, the Bolsheviks and the Red Army are able to win um, and uh, this civil war. All right, And when they win, what's significant is that now, they are the clear leaders of this Russia. With that being said, this war, like I said earlier, is destructive. It's brutal. There's a lot of casualties. There's a lot of issues. And so after the war ends, it's not going to be all, you know, smiles and all just, you know, no brainer. Um, instead, you know, this new government is going to have to try to figure out how to mend the destruction, um, how to figure out, you know, what to do. Uh, now that the economy of Russia is in ruins and, and other things like that. So that's what we're kind of looking at uh, with this civil war. But, e but even with that being the case, now all of a sudden the Bolsheviks are the leaders of Russia, at least now officially. Again, this map shows us the land that's given up by Russia to Germany in that Brest-Livok, one of the kind of unpopular things that the Bolsheviks will do. Uh, giving up such a large amount of land. Uh, this, by the way, is a look at some of the death uh, uh, accompanying the Russian Civil War. And this, by the way, is a look at Leon Trotsky, a bunch of the Red Army and the Red Guards. And again, he's going to be a very powerful military leader, very effective, and we have to give him a lot of credit for the victory uh, that the Bolsheviks will have against the White Army in the Russian Civil War. Okay, now that the Bolsheviks are in control, the next step to this is how are they going to restore order? We just established and we just said there's a lot of kind of chaos. There's a lot of craziness that's gone on and happened here. So how are you going to fix these problems? Okay, how are you going to, you know, do those things? And so the Bolsheviks have some plans for changes uh, that are going to hopefully restore order. So we're going to go through those now so we can understand this a little bit better. Okay. What you want to realize is that just because the Civil War has ended does not mean everything is perfect, okay? That includes those economic problems we were talking about, you know, the destruction, all the deaths, etc. 
But it also includes general unrest, people that are unhappy that the Bolsheviks are in control and in power. So the next step of this becomes, all right, how are you going to cement your control? How are you going to cement your power? And how are you going to put the, the Russians people and the Russian country on the route to success? And so that's what the Bolsheviks have to come up with. Well, one of the ways in which they're going to do this is they're going to use the Cheka or the secret police in order to um, enact these goals. And if you remember, we talked about this when we were talking about the kind of movement towards the Russian Revolution. Secret police was something used by many czars, all right? But for the Bolsheviks, they're going to use this even more so, all right? And again, you never quite know where these people are, who they are. And if there's anyone talking about, you know, rebelling or anyone talking about not liking the government or, you know, their support of another group as opposed to the Bolsheviks, the secret police will find out, they will arrest these people, they will imprison them, possibly kill them. Um, and the people know about the secret police and they know that there's friends that they've never seen again. So because of that, that's going to result in them being a little more careful uh, than just, you know, spouting out that they want to overthrow the government. So the, the government does kind of a good job in protecting their own power through the use of the Cheka, through the use of the secret police. There's also going to be another revolt that happens. I know at this point it seems like there's just a revolt all the time. This is the Kronstadt revolt. These are sailors in uh, Kronstadt, which is in Russia. They're going to revolt against the government. They wanted not the Bolsheviks in control. They wanted more government based on democracy and rights and equality and liberty. Um, but the government's response is basically pretty simple. Suppress the revolt. Okay. Suppress it with violence, all right? Uh, make it pretty clear, not only to the sailors who are rebelling at Kronstadt, but also other people that are kind of opposed to the Bolsheviks. If you revolt, we're not going to sit quietly by, okay? We are going to meet your revolt with, you know, violence and with destruction. And so now it's basically becoming pretty clear, okay, if you revolt against this government, they're going to come after you. So it's not as easy as maybe it was against the czars, uh, who weren't necessarily as powerful. So the government sending a pretty clear message through this. Okay, economically, uh, Lenin and the Bolsheviks need to think of kind of a way in which to repair some of the destruction from the Civil War and the other kind of economic issues that have plagued Russia. And what they come up with to do this is known as the NEP, or the New Economic Policy. This economic policy is short term, but basically the idea behind it is that in order to recover the economy, there's going to be some compromises made with capitalism. Remember, the Bolsheviks and Lenin are communists. They want a government completely run by the government. They do not want individual profit. They do not want private businesses. They want, you know, all businesses owned by the government. They don't want people to be able to sell excess, you know, goods for individual profit because that's seen as, you know, individualism, capitalism. That's not communism. But at this point, the economy is in such bad shape. Lenin says, hey, you know what? We're going to do a couple of things here that aren't so radical because we need to fix the economy. So what are some of these things? Okay, small private businesses are going to be allowed in Russia for the time being, right? So just a little bit of that, right? If farmers make a little extra grain, they can sell it for individual profit, you know, giving them some incentives and things like that. Again, these are traditionally big no-nos in communism, and certainly they were big no-nos for the Bolsheviks. But at the same time, the situation within Russia after the Civil War is so messy that this is what's deemed as necessary in order to restore order, restore the economy, and make sure Russia is on the path to success. Another thing that's going to happen, and you see this in the map here, is Russia is going to basically become not one singular unified place, but instead a series of self-governing republics. And you see them here on the map. There's 15 of them. Russia's obviously the biggest. All right, but in this way, these places are all one entity, but they are self-governing. They have their own respective, you know, rulers, 
again, the, the major ruler will rule over all of it, but they're able to do some things individually. With this being the case, Lenin and the Bolsheviks are going to decide Russia is not an appropriate name for the country anymore. And instead, they're going to change the name uh, of Russia to the USSR, the Soviet Union, or as it, you know, the full title here, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And that name is really important. It's really trying to draw together a few things. First off, it's a union. So these places, although republics, are in union with one another. All right. It's also socialist. We remember when Lenin came to power with the Bolsheviks, he said very clearly, we are going to establish a new socialist order in Russia. So the fact that they're going to name the country and say they are socialist is showing that commitment. And then the last part, Soviets, well, remember, the Bolsheviks had really grown in power through their membership in the Soviets, those local councils throughout Russia, uh, before the revolution. And so, really, what we're looking at here is them paying kind of tribute to those Soviets, saying, hey, you know, that's what helped put us on the map. Okay, that's what helped us be successful. And so that's what's going to happen. So even though we we'll sometimes refer to Russia when we talk about them here, from here on out, we really want to refer to them as the Soviet Union. All right. And they will be the Soviet Union until 1991. All right. So for about the next 70 years, they'll be the Soviet Union. Another thing they're going to do is they're going to say, hey, you know what? We need to also change the capital. The capital used to be St. Petersburg. They say that's so much about the old czar, the old dynasty. Let's move the capital to Moscow, right? So they're going to move the capital to Moscow also, uh, which is definitely a, a change. Okay, they also are going to do something interesting. They're going to say, now that they're established, they're no longer going to be called the Bolshevik Party, right? That's where there's a line through. It says the Bolshevik Party, no more, okay? Because the Bolshevik Party only represented this one group of communists within Russia, and so instead, what they're going to do is they're going to call themselves the Communist Party, right? Therefore, representing that they are committed to the ideas of Karl Marx. They're, they're committed to the ideas of communism. And then also trying to kind of make it clear in this respect, which is that, you know, we represent everyone within the Soviet Union. Okay, that's what we're doing here and stuff like that. And we'll get into this a little bit later, but this is the only political party that is allowed in the Soviet Union. Okay, nothing else. Uh, so that's another thing that we're kind of looking at and want to be paying attention to because uh, these are quite significant changes. This, by the way, is going to be the new flag of the Soviet Union. And uh, this is actually a symbol of communism, the hammer and the sickle. Um, and really, again, showing this commitment to communism in the Soviet Union. Okay, even though the Bolsheviks, or now the Communist Party, have established, um, you know, their control and their power, etc., another thing that I kind of want to draw to your attention is in regards to the struggle to succeed Lenin and what's going to kind of happen as far as leadership um, in this regard. And so anyways, remember Lenin so dynamic. He is the clear leader of the Bolsheviks. Well, unfortunately for him, he's going to die in 1924, a series of strokes uh, that had really left him in, in bad shape. And finally, the, the fatal one coming in 1924. Okay, what this means basically is who's going to be the next leader of not only the Communist Party, but now it becomes you know, whoever's the leader of the Communist Party is the leader of all of the Soviet Union. So it's a big, big deal um, as to what that's going to look like. All right, there are two clear people that are kind of the front runners for this. All right, the first is Leon Trotsky, somebody that we were talking about before, and the other is Joseph Stalin. All right, so um, that's kind of how things are shaping up. Uh, into the early 1920s when Lenin is really sick and then into, you know, the mid, late 1920s when it's, when Lenin is actually dead and there is a need for a successor. All right. When this is first happening, Trotsky seems like the logical choice to succeed Lenin. First off, if you remember, Trotsky was the leader of the Red Army, right? His leadership during the, um, Russian Civil War was incredibly 
impactful. Another thing about Trotsky is that Trotsky um, was really Lenin's clear number two. I mean, very vocal, a, a public face around not only the party, but around the Soviet Union as a whole. So he seemed to be the logical candidate. However, Trotsky, because he was such a public face, because he was the clear number two, definitely had quite a few en enemies. And these enemies really did not want Trotsky to continue um, and to be the main ruler of the Soviet Union. So because of that, some of them will be looking at another man, his name, Joseph Stalin. Okay, in order to understand this guy, Joseph Stalin, it's good if you talk about his nickname. And his nickname is the Man of Steel. And we're not going to get Superman here, but we are talking about a situation where he is somebody that is seen kind of like steel. Tough, hard, cold, not very personable per person, all right? So again, very different dynamic than, than Trotsky. Again, you know, kind of a tough, a tough exterior um, at the very least. All right, who is uh, Stalin? Stalin is part of the Communist Party as well. He's relatively high up, but he is not a very uh, visible face. He's a party secretary. And what he really does is he kind of works behind the scenes in that but as he works behind the scenes, he's also, you know, getting more acquainted with kind of the inner workings of the government, the Communist Party, etc. The other thing is that because of his position of party secretary, he has the ability to make key appointments into the party and into the party leadership. And so what he's doing is, you know, through this, he's putting his supporters into the top positions of the Communist Party. Right. And also, as you can imagine, as he's putting his supporters in the top ranks of the Communist Party, he's eliminating and removing Trotsky supporters. All right. So, again, solidifying his power. As Lenin is dying and kind of considering who's going to take over, he was very afraid of Stalin. OK. And he thought Stalin would be somebody that couldn't handle all the power of being, you know, this big leader and this undisputed leader and this leader who would do whatever they wanted uh, within the Soviet Union. Uh, but nonetheless, his fears are kind of too late and not enough heard. And by 1929, Stalin had replaced Trotsky supporters in the le party leadership with his own supporters. And what will happen is he will send Trotsky into exile. Uh, by 1921, Stalin has officially marked himself as the leader of the Soviet Union um, and the leader of the Communist Party. All right. So, again, this is very significant because now he's going to put his plans into action. And that's what we're going to look at next. What exactly are these plans? How do these things look? Um, and how did they represent the vision that, you know, Stalin had in store here? Uh, anyways, you see here the two guys on the left. This is Trotsky. On the right, we have Stalin. All right, here, by the way, we have a look at um, all three um, of our guys. Lenin in the middle. You see Stalin uh, to the left, Trotsky to the right. And let me just uh, show you this quote here by Lenin going back to his fears of Stalin. He said, Stalin, having become secretary general, has unlimited authority concentrated in his hands and I'm not sure whether he will always be capable of using that authority with sufficient caution. Uh, Lenin, you know, knowing that this leader was all powerful and very concerned that Stalin would not be able to use this leadership and use this power in the right way. All right. So now we're going to start to look at how will he use this power? How will this look? Now that Stalin's in control, it's obviously important to kind of understand what were his viewpoints because his viewpoints and his beliefs are going to play out into what his course of action is going to be uh, for changing old Russia into his Soviet Union. Um, 
In order to understand Stalin's viewpoints, the first thing that we'll do is we'll understand what Stalin's viewpoints were not. And that was the ideas of a world revolution. Trotsky and Lenin were both very vocal and said that what they wanted to see was a world revolution. And for them, Russia was just step one. And so their idea was, you know, that would be the first thing that would happen. And then the goal would basically be to have an entire revolution of proletariats, of the workers, um, encompass the whole world. All right. So that was kind of his viewpoint, his thinking of how he wanted this uh, to kind of happen and go about. Um, what makes Stalin different is Stalin thought that that was unnecessary. And he said, you know what? We have a lot of issues. We have a lot of problems and we need to focus on just ourselves. And so we refer to this concept and what Stalin believed in as socialism in one country. This idea that let's focus in on the Soviet Union. And what Stalin said was, look, if we can make the Soviet Union the perfect communist state, maybe other countries will follow our example. Okay, But we need to focus on ourselves and fixing us before we're trying to, you know, launch this worldwide revolution. Um, in this way, what makes Stalin's viewpoints interesting is that it's not just communism, but it's also about Russian nationalism, right? Again, trying to finally make Russia a legitimate world power. Um, another thing, kind of going back to this, is not only does he want to make Russia world power, but he also wants to make sure that Russia is well defended. Stalin says, look throughout history, it says people love to invade Russia, right? Napoleon invaded Russia, World War I, there was fighting going on in, in Russia, you know, it's this common thing that's going on. And he says, in the past, we haven't really been strong enough to defend ourselves. So let's make sure that when we do this, not only are we trying to make ourselves a big, you know, power, but we're also able to defend ourselves from attack. So countries know they just can't come on in and think everything's going to be, you know, all uh, great, but instead they're going to experience some issues and problems. And again, we've seen last class, all the czars have wanted to do, well, I mean, not all, but a big thing they've wanted to do is make Soviet Union or make what was Russia advanced, industrialized, etc unable to do so. This is when Stalin's going to see this as the opportunity. Let's make the Soviet Union advance. Okay, let's get them to where they need to be uh, so we can move in that sort of direction. And this, by the way, is a look at propaganda in regards to Stalin. We're going to see Stalin utilize a lot of propaganda, and this is just one example. Okay, so two major economic things that Stalin is going to be responsible for, an industrial revolution and an agricultural revolution. So let's start with the industrial revolution that's going to take place um, because this is the most significant and the most impactful. Okay, remember the original policy enacted by the Bolshevik government is the new economic policy or the NEP, this kind of compromise with capitalism. And yeah, no one wanted that, but it just was necessary. At the time Stalin takes control, he says, no. He says, we're done with the NEP. All right, we need to move ourselves into the direction of communism. Okay, in order to fix the economy, what Stalin is going to do is he's going to implement a five-year plan. All right, and the reason I have command economy here is because if you recall from our discussions on um, Marx and Adam Smith and things like that. A command economy is an economy where all things are controlled by the government. The government tells factories, industries, etc., what to produce, how much to produce, all those type of things. And so, in this way, when this five-year plan comes into play, which again is this idea of you know industrialization for Russia, it's going to be the um, government that's telling the industries what to do, and they're going to be facilitating everything as opposed to a free market economy, as proposed, if you remember, by um, Adam Smith. Okay, we're going to get a little more into this, but again, the goal of this five year plan is to achieve industrialization, achieve industrial growth. And the reality is, in this regard, this is going to be incredibly successful. All right, and I'm going to show you some graphs and some stats and some figures, but 
Russia will become a major industrial power as a result of these five-year plans. Now, how do they do it? What exactly does this look like? Well, basically, the reason why it's called a five-year plan is that Stalin slash the government, they're going to tell certain industries, hey, you need to produce this amount of electricity, for example, this amount of steel, this amount of iron, this amount of oil, all right? And this is your quota, all right? And that's what you need to achieve in the five years, all right? These quotas or these targets are incredibly high. They're basically impossible to actually be met. But nonetheless, because people are so fearful of not meeting them and their punishments, they're striving as hard as they can to reach them. And again, they're not going to actually reach the intended targets, but just the fact that they're even somewhat close is a big change from what we've seen before. Okay, This also comes at a huge sacrifice for your average Soviet person. The access to consumer goods is going to be incredibly small. All right, So these people are going to have you know, minimal access to adequate housing, minimal access to just basic necessities, even food is going to be pretty hard to come by. All right. But these are the types of things and sacrifices that seen as necessary in order for the entirety of Russia to advance and do better. The government is also the one that's in charge of all this stuff. So again, we kind of talked about, okay, they're the ones that are setting these targets. They are the ones setting these quotas. But they're also the ones telling people where they should work or where they can work and where they can't work. They're going to control movement of workers so they can't just move to another job. All right. They're going to punish people for not fulfilling these, you know, quotas, these targets, etc. Um, they are overseeing the factories. They are in control of them. It's really a, a, a pretty impressive thing uh, that comes into play here. In order to also get people to abide, the uh, Communist Party uh, government will use the secret police to kind of check in on factories. And if they find people that are not doing their fair share and not contributing and stuff like that, they're going to punish them. And we'll talk kind of more about punishment in a little bit. But again, just like before, people know that these people are around and they're fearful of these punishments. And so because of that, that's going to result in, you know, better work effort, better work policy, etc. And so we'll be looking at that more as we go through this. The reality is the results of this industrialization are incredibly impressive. All right. The first five-year plan lasts from 1928 to 1932. During this time, massive increases in, in oil production, steel production, all that kind of stuff. All right. And so much so that after even the first one, Stalin will employ a few more. All right. Again, similar type of goals, uh, you know, different in specifics, but overall increased industrialization, increased production, all the rest of that kind of stuff. Because of these five year plans and because basically this forced industrialization, the Soviet Union for really the first time will become a major industrial power. All right. And so, again, it's interesting to think how much things can change over a relatively short period of time. And certainly that's what happens here uh, with the Soviet Union through these five-year plans and through these moves to industrialization. Um, again, some more propaganda that we're seeing here. Um, by the way, again, some more propaganda that um, is kind of showing and emphasizing the work for the five-year plans. This is for the, uh, the second five-year plan. And I also want to show you this, which really shows just how much production goes up. You can see here, this starts in 1927. You can see how low all the production was. I mean, if you look even at steel, it's so small, it's barely even can be seen in 1927. However, look at how many, you know, millions of tons are being produced even in the short term into 1930. And then by 1940, wow, that's a massive increase in a relatively short period of time. And again, these things are done through these five years plan. Basically forces Russia to industrialize is a huge sacrifice on the Russian people, but nonetheless will result in Russia becoming a major industrial power. And again, just a couple of highlights about the first and second five-year plan. But again, the same thing kind of overall. Industrial production increased. Uh, you know, unemployment's going to drop. 
Um, you know, we're seeing the actual move from, you know, the countryside to the cities uh, actually happening. We knew that wasn't before. And again, you know, this idea of making the Soviet Union an industrial power and, you know, really a world power, because that's how you become world power right now, it's just through swift industrialization, is going to happen through this. So, again, very impressive uh, what they're able to do. Again, massive sacrifice, but nonetheless, um, still an accomplishment. All right, the next major revolution that's going to under, uh, be undertaken under uh, the rule of Stalin is going to be in agriculture and in the farming realm. And so let's talk about this. All right, first off, this one is not going to be as really swift or as clean as the industrialization that will take place. And when we're talking about this, we're talking about a relatively brutal uh, forced um, agricultural revolution that Stalin's going to impose on the peasants living in the countryside. Stalin's ultimate goal is to create collective farms, to basically take the millions of farms that are individually owned or, you know, even or even owned by a small group and make them collective where multiple people, multiple families, etc., are farming collectively and they're farming together. And remember, that's a major theme of communism. And, you know, everyone does everything together. It's all so nice, you know, whatever. So that's kind of the goal of, of what he wants to do. The peasants don't want to do this, all right? And again, you can think about what a tough time the Russian peasants have had this far. They were first serfs. Then finally, when serfdom was done, then they thought, oh, great, we're going to get land. No, if you remember, they belonged to those peasant communities. They didn't own the land. They owned stuff to the government. Now, finally, the revolution has ended. And if you recall, they said, oh, you know, peace, land, and bread. Oh, we're going to get land. Well, not really, because now the government is telling people in the countryside, okay, you know, you're going to form these collective farms and we're going to tell you what to produce, how much to produce and all the rest of these stuff. Spencer, like, leave us alone. OK, give us our independence. All right? We just want to be able to dictate this stuff by ourselves. OK, but that's not the way this works, because remember, this is a, you know, government control of the economy. So in order to combat this for peasants that go away from this and don't c come into play here, we're going to see them. Uh, be killed by the government. Okay, the other thing that happens is some are sent to what are known as gulags. These are basically labor camps and are located in Siberia, which is on the way eastern part of Russia. It's incredibly cold. It's incredibly, you know, tough conditions. They work all day. And, you know, most of these people are never seen from again. Okay, so that's the reality if you're a peasant. And you don't want to go along with this. So again, it's forced. All this stuff is forced in order to achieve results. Some peasants will even go as far as destroying their crops in order to kind of defy the government and kind of let them know, you know what, we're not just going to go about with whatever you want. Okay, we want to make it very clear that, you know, you just can't, you know, jump on in here and just make us do these things. All right. When that happens, again, those people experience punishments like death, like the gulags, etc. But the other thing the government's going to do is, you know what? They're going to say, we're going to confiscate all the land that's left, all right? And we're going to make sure that you guys collectivize, all right? And we're, we're going to really dictate this policy. You can't do it yourself. You don't want to do it yourself. We're going to force you to do so. The move to collectivization will result in huge famines for Russia, all right? Some of this is like kind of punishment, but some of this is also in regards to just the fact that collectivization typically does not work. There's no incentive to grow more, so usually, you know, there's not enough grown. Um, the other thing is that the government wants to feed the city workers, which are really their priority. So they're going to take so much food that's being produced out in the countryside and just give it to the city. So therefore, your peasants don't have food. And so millions will die as a result of starvation. That being said, these methods and these tactics will be successful for Stalin and collectivization will be achieved. Um, by the later part of the 1930s, um, you know, 90 plus percent of all the farmland in um, the Soviet Union will be collectivized. So again, it, brutal, tough, but he is able to achieve what he wanted. Uh, by the way, you can see, you look at these collective farms here in the picture. Um, and again, another thing I want to kind of make a comment of is, again, the human cost of this is incredibly high, which is so many dead uh, you know, just such a tough dilemma and dynamic that comes into play here. 
All right, this, by the way, is an article, and it says about 6 million people that died in the Soviet famine. So, again, these come at a big price. And, by the way, these are the gulags. This is a gulag in Siberia. We don't have too many pictures from here because, obviously, it was pretty secret. But, again, these are tough conditions, and these are people that disrespected the government who are forced to go here. And, again, this could include workers as well, but a lot of these people are peasants that were basically angry at having to collectivize. All right, the last thing I want to talk about when talking about Stalin, and again, we're going to spend more time looking at this when we look at the primary sources, is what Stalin establishes is what we refer to as a totalitarian state. So when we talk about Stalin, what he does is he creates a totalitarian government. And what this basically means is you see the word total in this. That has a lot to do with this. When we're talking about total in this case, it's the total control by the government over everything. The government controls, as you saw, the economy. The government controls, you know, public opinion. The government controls, you know, the press. The, everything that possibly is going on in a country, it's the government who's in complete and total control. What that means is that if you do not give total and complete support of the government, you are going to end up dead. Right, so many enemies of the government are arrested and they are killed under Stalin. And the reason why I have enemies in quotations is many of these enemies are not real. Okay, they're what Stalin perceives to be enemies. All right, or they're threats that he fears, or you know other things like that. Uh, but either way, he will make the decision to get rid of these people. Okay, part of a totalitarian state is usually ridding of religion, and so Stalin's going to close down churches other religious centers, and again, making it illegal to practice religion. And the reason why is, is he wants people to give their total loyalty to the government. He does not want them to give any kind of loyalty to a god or anything like that. Schools forbidden from teaching religion. I mean, it's a really kind of tough way in which uh, public opinion is going to be altered. All right, another thing he's going to do when he's solidifying his control is in the 1930s, he starts to turn against communists. And that's the picture that you see here on the right side. These were Lenin's general staff in 1917, the people that, you know, helped the communists win control of the government, win the revolution, etc. And by, you know, later part of the 1930s, Stalin has killed most of them or sent them into exile or something like that. Okay, so how can you say you're getting rid of enemies of the government when these are people that, you know, supported the government the whole time? But again, this is the real dynamic that you want to be looking at and paying attention to there. Okay, the people also are, you know, definitely, uh, you know, tried on very odd crimes. Um, and typically they have trials that are referred to as show trials because literally they're just that. They're just literally for show. All right. But that's kind of the way in which this kind of works. And again, the government has all power to do this. Because of Stalin's, you know, going after people, no one is safe. And so people are going to watch what they say. Obviously, they're not going to do anything brash, but they're also going to be kind of, you know, always having one, you know, ear over the shoulder, kind of listening in and, and wondering what's kind of going on and what's happening. Okay. Again, when you talk about Stalin, it's an incredibly tough rule. Okay. He forces collectivization. He forces industrialization. And he controls the media. The secret police are around. They kill many, many people. Okay. But when we talk about Stalin, we also have to give him credit because his goal was to industrialize the Soviet Union, make them a strong military power, strong industrial power, a strong world power. And by the time Stalin is done, and even before he's done, the Soviet Union has moved into the realm of a world power. So again, it's not a pretty road to transition, but nonetheless, he's done this. Uh, that being said, though, this advancement has come at a price. And that price is that ultimately, kind of ironically, people in Russia are less free than they were when they lived under the Tsar. All right. So again, this is significant to kind of consider here. Uh, this, by the way, is a look at Stalin and, you know, kind of pointing fun at the fact of how many people he killed. 
We don't know the exact numbers, but estimates for Stalin are usually around 25 to 30 million people that he's responsible for killing. Um, and some estimates would have it far, far more. Um, so again, this is a brutal and tough rule. And again, no one is safe. Um, here, by the way, is a look at some of this. This is actually from an event known as the Purge, which or the Great Purge, which we're going to talk about um, in the primers. And then here are a couple of videos if you want to watch these in regards to uh, kind of, you know, Stalin's rule and his forms of control. Uh, so you can see that a little bit better. All right. Thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you found this helpful into looking at how the Bolsheviks are able to complete their control and looking at Stalin's rule. Talk to you soon.